Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name's Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. My guest today is Darren Perry. He also came to my house, so that's two in a row. Um, but that's not common. Most of my guests are going to be online on the phone. But yeah, I was really excited to have uh, Darren here as well. I found Darren because um, my podcast mentor, Richie Stedman, he's like, oh yeah, you should you should contact Darren Perry. He's awesome. And I was like, okay. And so I reached out to Darren way at the beginning and I said, I'm doing this project. I was wondering if you'd be interested. He's like, yeah, I would love to be. Right now is not a good time. Reach out to me in a little while and we'll figure it out. So I waited. Um, and when I reached out this time, he was like, yeah, I'd love to. I even come down there sometimes. So he doesn't live like next door to me or anything. So he came down from Providence to Bluffdale. So that's a far ways. It was absolutely wonderful to have him here. And my thoughts were like so scattered. I'm sure you can tell that my thoughts are scattered most days. But for some reason, I, it was like just shotgun topics. Boom. Like all over the place. So I hope you um, understand. I hope you, <laughs> I hope you enjoy. I hope you learn something. And I hope you feel the spirit. Um, my guest is Darren Perry. Today I am here in my house with my friend, my new friend, Darren Perry. Would you please introduce yourself, Darren? Yes, thank you for having me. My name is Darren Perry. I am uh, a sixth generation Shoshone Latter-day Saint. I am a lifelong resident of Utah. And my ancestors probably lived here for thousands of years. And... Um, I'm a father of seven children, 14 grandchildren. I'm the former chairman of the Shoshone Nation, which is uh, significant because I've served my people for a long time, and that's always been important to me. And uh, I stepped down to run for Congress as chairman, and I still serve as a council member for our tribe. That's awesome. Cool. Um, now, this is my favorite part. Would you share something about your heritage, one of your favorite things, whether that's a story, a celebration, a way of life, anything, especially if it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ? The thing I love about my heritage, my Native American heritage, is um, how, our, how we learn, and, and that's through storytelling. And that's how our people learn for centuries. Um, the winter was always the elders' time to tell stories. And I remember sitting at the feet of my grandmother hearing these beautiful stories that teach values. But one of my favorite stories is about the eagle. And she told me that, uh, she said to me one day as a small child, she said, um, when a Shoshone boy or girl does an act of kindness or service, that boy or girl would get an eagle feather from the chief. And she said, uh, Darren, what would happen if you kept doing nice things for people for your whole life? Well, what would happen? And I said, well, I'd keep getting more eagle feathers. And she said, you're right. And if you kept doing that until you were an adult, how many do you think you'd have? And I said, oh, my gosh, probably too many to count if that's the way I le led my life. And so uh, she said, well, when the chief gets ready to die. And a Shoshone chief is always the chief until he dies. He calls the whole village together and he, he says, uh, I'm ready to die. I want all of you to pull out your eagle feathers and show me your eagle feathers. And it was the person that had the most eagle feathers would be the new chief. And she would then say, you know, the chief isn't the toughest or the bravest or the strongest. The chief is always the one in the community who has led a life of service that has helped their people in, in selflessly in other ways and so when you live your life that way uh, people want to be with you people want to follow you and so 
Um, that's always been my favorite story because it directly relates to who we are as Latter-day Saints, yeah. living a life of service and giving back to others and losing ourselves in the service. And if we're doing that in our life, then uh, everything else takes care of itself. Yeah, I love that. I um, The year that we did, uh, the first year of Come, Follow Me, and we did the um, lesson on the two great commandments, love the Lord with all thine heart, and then love love everybody else the same way. I'm like, man, if we just walked around with glasses like that, where we looked at every situation, are we loving the Lord and are we loving our neighbor that would change the world, right? It would. And what does loving our neighbor mean? I mean, it means doing kind things yeah. and, and not judging when they're different from us. Yeah. And, and I love differences in people. I look at people and think, this is just like a beautiful field of wildflowers. Yeah. We're all different. But it's how we treat each other. Uh, regardless of our religious background, regardless of our thoughts and feelings, if we can get to the place where... Uh, they're just brothers and sisters, and we love them unconditionally. How much more better would this world be? Yeah, we live in today. Yeah, thank you. That's so. That's so great. So you mentioned. Okay, so you mentioned that um, you ran for Congress. Uh, what motivated you to do that? That's a great question because I've never run for office for anything, not even in <laughs> elementary, and so. <laughs> My first big thing is running for U.S. Congress, and so <laughs> uh, I was kind of talked into it. Um, you know, I live in northern Utah. I live up by Logan in Providence, and I uh, had a couple of friends tell me Rob Bishop, who was the congressman for 22 years, was stepping down, and, and I know Rob really well, and he's a wonderful man, and uh, they just said, you need to think about running. We need good people. We need choices. And so I said, well, I'm kind of the environment and public lands and those things are really important to me because of my Native American heritage. And sometimes, you know, I might lean a little bit more on the Democrat side. And, and if I run as a Democrat, there's no way I'm going to get elected uh -huh. because I've lived here my whole life. And so, and then I thought, well, I'm too conservative to be a Democrat uh -huh. because I'm fiscally responsible. I'm pro-life. Pro I mean, there's just so many things in my life that says I'm not that. But I thought, well, I so I looked at it and there were 12 Republicans in the primary running to take his place. Oh, geez. And I thought, well, I've never been in politics and I don't think the Republicans will accept me all of a sudden coming in at the last minute. Sure. Yeah. So I thought, there's only one Democrat challenger. And she's a woman, and she's really liberal. And I thought, no, oh, I don't know. But then one day, a wonderful friend of mine named uh, Elder Larry Echohawk uh -huh. called me and said, right before the pandemic, said, hey, let's meet for lunch at the Red Iguana. And I said, okay. So I love the Red Iguana. Who doesn't? <laughs> so I met him, and he starts talking to me about politics. And I had no idea. Uh-huh. And he said, you know, my background. And I said, yeah, I've known you my whole life. He was the attorney general in Idaho. Yeah. He ran for governor. He said, let me tell you about governor. The day before the election, I was six points ahead. And I thought it was a done deal. It was over. And then the election came and I lost by like 500 votes out of a, millions of votes. Yeah. He said it was a 50-50 thing, but I lost. And he said, I thought my life was over. And then from there, I go teach law school at BYU, from there the Obama administration, and, and so he's a Democrat. Yeah. And so he said the Obama administration um, let me work as an assistant the secretary of interior. So I went back there, and then the brethren called me and say, can you fly out here and give us a report on the state of Native Americans today? Uh -huh. So I fly out to Salt Lake and give this one-hour presentation they asked one question and dismissed me. He said, so I'm going back out going, well, okay. I don't know how I did, but he said, so I get back on a plane and go home to D.C. with my wife. And and then I get a call a couple of weeks later that says, the Lord needs you. 
Mm -hmm. to serve as a 70. And he said, after the election, I thought my life was over and I didn't even win. But look at the things I've been able to do to help our people. And he said, I'm just encouraging you to look at it and be prayerful about it because uh, you may not win, but you may set the example for a Native American youth coming up that has never had the confidence to do something like that before. Uh And you may really open doors for others that might follow you. And so that's why I did. I mean, that really, well, being prayerful about it. But it was a good experience. I met so many wonderful people that have been helping me make uh, my goals and what I'm trying to do with our tribe uh, more out in front now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, debating on live TV, it just brings you a different perspective than you've ever had before. So, yeah. I won't do it again if that's the next (laughs) question. (laughs) Never. And you can write that down. Uh, Wonderful experience, but uh, I'm not a politician. Yeah. So as the chairman of your tribe, what, um, how do you feel like the Lord led you in that position? Um, Line by line. And yeah. so, I, you know, years and years ago, I ran for tribal council. We have a council of seven. Then the seven pick the tribal chairman. Okay. And so that's how it kind of works today, even though my grandmother told me these stories. Yeah. But th- she was teaching me a value and yes. teaching me how to live. Yeah. But so I served on the council for four years, decided not to do it anymore. Took about four years off and then decided I wanted to do it again. And so I did it again and uh, was serving for a while. And then um, I said I wanted to be the chairman. And, and they voted on it, and they didn't vote me in. Uh-huh. And I thought, oh, my gosh. I was devastated. Oh, yeah. And they made me vice chairman. But looking back on it now, and, and I, I've been serving for, like, probably uh, 14 years now straight. And, and looking back on it, it was a blessing because I wasn't ready to be the chairman. Uh-huh. And and by that, I just mean sometimes the chairman's role, you get thrust into public eye. And I think there were some edges that needed to be rounded off for me uh-huh. that I just needed to uh, go through a few more things, mature a little bit, gain a little different perspective uh-huh. before I served as chairman. And, and so... Uh, it was a wonderful calling, a lot more signing of documents and stuff than I care to. Yeah. And while I don't serve as the chairman today, I still have the role of of most of the media requests and, and most the, almost all of the speaking engagements. I still do all of that. So yeah. I just got out of the paper signing. Yeah. So, and I think in two years when I'm up for re-election, I'm just going to fade off into the sunset. I retire we've, we've got so many other youth that are coming up that are educated that i think are ready to just take on that responsibility it's not a paid position so um i think our tribe's in good hands going forward but there's other things i want to do yeah so what what was your career before before you're basically doing this full-time for your tribe i've had a lot of careers in yeah. my lifetime i i um uh, I got my teaching degree. Uh I always wanted to be a teacher. My dad, when I was little, was a high school basketball coach. And so that's what I wanted to do, teach teach history because of my grandmother Uh and uh, coach sports. And so, you know, I got my degree and got ready to teach. And I got a call from a good friend that said, there's a golf course manager job open. Uh And, And I golf a lot. And so I thought, well... How much does it make? And I'm looking at both and I'm going, well, that's a lot more than teachers make. And And I I would be at a golf golf course. (laughs) So I took it. And that led me down a path of I I worked for my neighbor who was Bill Child, who was the owner of R.C. Willies and founder. I worked for him a little while. And then I started a staffing company, a temporary staffing company to provide employees for companies. And I was doing that before the tribe employed me to Uh uh, to raise money for this interpretive center yeah so you said you have seven kids how um how have their lives do they are they members of the church do they still actively participate in the church 
Yes, all of them but one. Uh, and I loved him to death. And yeah. he's my second to the oldest. And, you know, having seven children is really, you just get the opportunity to parent a lot. Yeah, and, so, and all different ways. And, yes. And, and you know, you think you parent the same with all of them, but they take different paths yeah. and they, they do different things. And when they get older and it's like, wait a minute, that's not what I taught you. I taught everybody else this. And so for me, it's it's always about just loving them unconditionally, yeah. regardless of what path they took. Yeah. And making sure I'm praying night and day for them. Mm -hmm. Because I know at the end of the day, they've been taught right. And I feel uh, we have a loving Heavenly Father and Mother who really are invested in this and yeah. want the best for all of us. So I think as long as I keep loving them and praying for them, and I think one day things will come back around the yeah. way they're supposed to. And the Savior has so much mercy for all of us. Like, I don't, I don't even think we can imagine how much he has for us no and if people knew they they would be way less judgmental of themselves yeah and so uh yeah he loves us on a different way that we don't even understand yeah and understands sometimes why we make some of those decisions i don't know why my son has made some decisions and not others but there may be other things that i really don't know about or how he's looked at things that have shaped that yeah and so, but our Savior does. Yeah. He knows at the end of the day. And that's why he's the perfect judge and we're not. Yeah. And our job is to love and that's it. Yeah. So what favorite callings have you had in the church throughout your life? <laughs> My favorite one is now. Now that we're out of the pandemic, we've had two weeks. Uh, they called me to be in the primary. Uh -huh. I teach four-year-olds in the oh primary. Oh my gosh. And that, well, I've only done it for two weeks and uh, I love that. Yeah. So at this time of my life, my wife and I teach that. And so, but forever, I think I've been the gospel doctrine teacher for probably 40 years of my life. Are Just you kidding me? Long, long time of gospel doctrine. And so, holy smokes. I just have always tried to share a different perspective in the gospel doctrine class, though. And, uh, yeah, it's more of a, the way my grandmother taught me, storytelling and relating the scriptures to yeah. real life and things. So yeah, uh, I don't know why I've always been called to that, but it's, it's weird that that's what I tend to do. Huh. That's, wow, 40 years of your, that's <laughs> a long, It's a long time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'll say a cuss word every now and then. And my wife says, well, why'd you say that? And so they don't call me to be the bishop or stake president. <laughs> <laughs> so she looks at me and goes, "Oh, brother." <laughs> yeah, I have Seriously. a I have a brother who like wears crazy clothes and like does his hair different ways every single time I see him. And I, but he is like, they like go to church every Sunday. They do family scriptures and prayer. Mm -hmm. Like they and they told the line exactly. But you look at him and you're like, so yeah, I think he does that on purpose to um to stave off those callings too <laughs> <laughs> i think our heavenly father knows i've I, i've just i've got so many things i'm doing for our tribe to to help tell their story and so i'm almost done doing that and i think once i do that i don't know i still love my primary though yeah. i mean i'll take those four-year-olds all day yeah do you want to serve a mission when whenever you yes can? that's really an important thing my wife and i'd like to do uh -huh. we would uh love to serve and i would love to serve in a native american community mm -hmm. if i could uh, right now i'm kind of working closely with the president of the pocatello idaho mission okay he called me and, and he said you don't know me i'm the president up here but our mission encompasses the fort hall indian reservation mm -hmm. through their shoshone bannock uh -huh. and i said well we're not shoshone bannock we're a different tribe but i, I know them really well uh-huh and I, he said, well, I, I have sister missionaries out there and, and I just read your book and I learned about the conversion of, of your people to the gospel. And I just have felt impressed to call you to see if there's any way you can talk to our sisters that are out there and uh -huh. give them some ideas on how maybe they can approach the Native Americans out there. And so 
over the last six months, I've been able to talk to all the sisters and serve there and talk to the mission president and just give them some insight on Native American culture. Yeah. And who they are and why they may not look at you when you're speaking to them. And yeah. there's some differences there and just how to approach them and yeah. gain that trust. Cause yeah. I think that's really important too. Yeah. Um, so let's see what, when did you, um, gain your own personal testimony of the book of Mormon? It was one year into my mission. And I hate to say that because uh, I think that's not that surprising. Yeah, I know. But I grew up, I, as I said before, I'm a sixth generation Latter-day Saint. So sure. my great, great, great grandfather's chief Sagwitch joins the church in 1873. And and from all the writings of pioneers that met him and, and helped with the missionary effort with our people, they referred to our tribe after their conversion with like the people of Ammon, yeah. how faithful they were. In fact, one of the missionaries that baptized them all said, they have a childlike faith that transcends anything I've ever seen. Yeah. And they do everything you ask them exact. And, and, so, and your tribe's the one that helped build the Logan Temple. Yes. Yeah. That, so like they put in the most hours, hours. Per, per unit, right? Yeah, they did. And so... And they'd only been members of the church not very long. Yeah. So I just look at that culture and that history and, and my DNA. And and although I've been an active member my whole life, I just kind of took it for granted growing up and playing sports and everything else was more important than, you know, I went through the routines of going to church and doing my callings, but yeah. I never really thought I was very spiritual. And then I get sent to Manchester, England on a mission. And, so. <laughs> and that's a whole new world. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But, you know, while I'm there, I'm studying the gospel every morning, something I'd never really done my whole life. And I, I really fell in love. My grandmother sent me a letter about our people's role in the Book of Mormon on our people's role in the gathering of Israel. And she says, we're it. We are going to lead out in this. And so... From then on, I took it way more serious. And I really, I first I'd get in the Book of Mormon and look up just references to Lamanites and, and their role yeah. in the future. And But then it just, it has become, after about a year out of my mission, I really, you know, got on my knees and was prayerful about it and, and had an overwhelming feeling that uh, the book was true. I've, I've always felt the book was true, but... Yeah. Maybe from a historical perspective growing uh -huh. up versus having the spirit tell you to your heart yeah. that it's true. And so that, you know, it happened on my mission. Thankfully so. Uh -huh. Yeah. How did you meet your wife? Well, we're on our second marriage. So we're both been married a couple of times. And so um, I met her. Uh, we got married eight years ago. On LDS singles. Uh -huh. So she was from Tampa, Florida, and, and I'd been divorced a little while. And so uh, my daughter set up an account. And, uh, You're like, fine. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but the first person I messaged on there was her. Really? In Tampa, Florida. And I thought, well, that's safe. I'm ne never going to meet her anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and her profile said, I'm six foot tall. And I'm like, five eight and a half and i'm thinking yeah this is she's really cute but this isn't gonna happen but over time you just get talking to someone i flew out there in january this year she was a southern baptist her whole life uh -huh. an active one like church twice a week and and did all the camps and and then the elders knocked on her door uh on the beach she had a condo on the beach in florida and and taught her the gospel and, and she joined and then a year later she went through the temple and got her endowment and uh, i met her after that even so i i met her after she'd already joined the church but uh yeah her conversion story is really pretty amazing and so uh it's been a really good partnership for both of us yeah she she understands me and she just <laughs> She lets me do my thing, especially uh -huh. my native thing. And at first she goes, I had to really check you out because 
you were telling me all these things you do, but I didn't really believe that that could be possible. <laughs> she goes, I never knew a Native American in my whole life in Florida. And and so I would go to my new ward and say, is this guy legit? Will you guys Google him and check him out? And so that's she said, I was really, I did my homework on you before you let you come out to see me. Uh-huh. But it's been pretty awesome since. That's so great. <laughs> that's so great. Um Let's see, what, um, who are some people in your life that have really directed your life, who have been mentors and um, just been been teachers to you? And- well, the very first one and probably the biggest one is my grandmother, May Timbimbu Perry. And you could Google search her and be busy for a month uh-huh. reading about her. So my parents both worked, and they dropped me off at her house. Uh So for the first five years, six years of my life, I was sitting at her feet doing beadwork, brain tanning, deer hides. I mean, and then she was always having historians come to the door, like college professors doing research on our culture. And She was a product of the boarding school system, Mm -hmm. but she got educated, and she came home and got her English degree at LDS Business College. So she was smart, and she did something that re- literally changed our tribe. She started writing down all of the oral history oh, so of the great. tribe, so to preserve it. And you know, at the time, I'm all these people are coming to her home. These giants of history, Brigham Madsen, who was a history professor at the University of Utah, that wrote a book on it, but he gives all my grandmother credit for it. And, and I didn't know who they were. I was young and sure. didn't know, but I just knew every day there was a knock at the door and somebody was coming. Yeah. So, but she told me one day, she said, Darren, no one has ever wanted to hear our story before. One day you will have to make them listen. And, and I've just felt that my whole life, uh, trying to do the work that she's always tried to do and, uh, just ran out of time and didn't, didn't really get to do it. And I think the timing wasn't great. Uh-huh. Uh, the timing's really good now because I don't have to make people listen. People want to listen. Yeah. And then my father, of course. My father was a school teacher, and that's what I wanted to do. But then he took a job with the state of Utah. He was the director of Indian Affairs for the state of Utah for 15 years. Uh-huh. And he would drag me around to all of the reservations around the state, the seven other reservations, for meetings. And uh, I just learned a different perspective meeting all these tribal elders who I still know today and I've met you know over time and so my father really uh, introduced me to that side of the culture too uh-huh. and then uh, Larry Echo Huck I've known for a long time and he's been such a good friend to me and I'll call him every now and then and just say you know I give me some advice here because I'm struggling with what I might do and He's always so gentle and calm. Yeah. And he reminds me of my grandmother because in our culture, those tribal elders, that's who they were. They they don't get upset. They don't raise their voice. It's just always so steady and calm and soothing Uh that uh, that's who I kind of gravitate to. So, you know, those three have been pretty instrumental in my life. So uh, recently, like last week or maybe the week before I was I saw one of your posts on Facebook and you said history is complicated and I thought that is so like I wish people just looked at it like that it it is complicated so what what would you like to tell our listeners about you know I love that question because uh and when I said it you look at history. History is about examining things that have taken place, you know, at a different time and an era than we're living in. And I look at it as, uh, so I'm not a monument eraser. I'm not, I don't like to erase history. And yeah. Even though it may be hard and it may not be right according to what we know today, but history is complicated because we're, we're told to examine something, an event or anything through the lens of our perspective today. Yeah. Well, hopefully our perspective today is different than it was 150 years ago. Yeah. 
And so when we have these historical events that took place and like Brigham Young and the coming of the saints, that have a, that had a devastating effect on my people. Mm-hmm. It changed their way of life. It led to the Bear River Massacre, the ma- biggest massacre of Native Americans in the history of the U.S. But so, you know, as we tell those histories and stories, you can look at it and go, uh, when they wrote it down then, that's how they lived. It was the Wild West. In fact, we had a president of the United States that put a bounty on Native Americans' heads. Mm-hmm. So the value of a Native American uh, 150 years ago was was nothing. Mm-hmm. And so the fact that people treated them that way, uh, I'm not giving, that's not a license to treat people that way, but they thought differently than we do today. Mm-hmm. So it's always uh, hard for me to judge people that lived in that era on the values that we have today. Yeah. We know more. We should be way better today than we were then. Yeah. And so it's important for me as people look at historical things in the past that they can look at it and say, okay, is that really what happened? Or, and then look at it through the context of today's perspective. And maybe not only today's perspective, but another group's perspective. So instead of looking at it from the Mormon pioneer perspective, you look at it from the Shoshone perspective. And and is it the same? It wouldn't be the same at all. Yeah. But when you have both perspectives and have multiple perspectives on any certain thing that's happened, you're better able to come to a conclusion in your own mind what took place. Yeah. And uh, it's so much more easier to navigate the more information you have. And so uh, just a really quick example, the Daughters of Utah Pioneers at the Bear River Massacre site had this monument with a plaque on it that was really horrific, but it was they put it up. 69 years ago and and so you know when people stop today and look at it they think it's pretty horrific because it's not very accurate and so you know they approached me a year ago well we're going to change the plaque and i said how about this don't take off the plaque let's put up another plaque that kind of tells what we know today versus what they knew then and in that way, people can see a snapshot in time that this is where they were back then. Yeah. This is where we are today and how we can reconcile it because we know more today. Yeah. And, and we're able to recognize hard things and acknowledge hard things. That's the only time you can really get to reconciliation is if you acknowledge some past wrongs that it just allows you to heal and it allows a generation to heal that's never had the chance before. Yeah. And so, yeah, that history is complicated. It, it is because yeah. we all come from different walks of life. And I certainly wouldn't want to judge you by how you were raised. And I, I don't know all the, what has shaped you into the person you are, but uh, all I can do is, is try to live my life and look at everything and, and, make the best judgment I can. And then even with a judgment like that, you still uh, accept the people for who they are yeah. and move past it. It's not about what happened in the past. To me, it's more about how can we take those events and how can we come together, acknowledge it, come together and, and be a better society today together. Yeah. That's the story to yeah. me. So. That's, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so as we've been sitting here, I've been thinking about um, President Nelson, and I'm supposed to ask you a question about him. So um, what what's some of the, the, the teachings that President Nelson has um, given that have affected you in your life? Or, or have there been... <laughs> Yeah, there has been. And, you know, I met him. I've met him on two occasions, but the most memorable one is was at the 150th anniversary of the Golden Spike uh-huh. in May. So we just had that an- so anniversary not very long ago. But he went out there and spoke. And I I was on the program, too. But as he was leaving the stage... Uh, I was standing over to the side in my headdress. I had this beautiful bald eagle headdress on. 
and I was standing next to our medicine man in our tribe, who is LDS, uh-huh. but he serves as our spiritual leader and medicine man. And, and uh, Richard Turley was with the prophet and taking him around. And Richard's a good friend of mine, and he saw me and he said, I'm going to come over. Uh-huh. And he brings the prophet over. President Nelson, and he says, President Nelson, this is uh, Chairman Perry. And uh, he grabbed my hand and, and we shook hands and he just held it. He didn't let go and he didn't move on. And he just grabbed my elbow and kind of pulled me close. And, and it was really moving because everybody wanted to talk to him or shake his hand or see him. Yeah. And and the fact that he would stop and, and have a two minute conversation with me and I uh, meant the world to me. And uh, what I love about him is his humility and his ability to uh, communicate in a way that I really understand. And I think people connect with, mm-hmm. you know, he's, he's a smart guy. He, he, he was a scientist and doctor, but uh, you don't get that when he's speaking on behalf of the Lord. And so um, I did make a, you know, my wife was recording this as because she's standing in the background and she's recording what we're saying. And and I went back and she said, did you realize what you said to the prophet? And I said, no. And she said, well, you did something really kind. You introduced him to Rios Pacheco. But you introduced him as uh, President Nelson. This is our spiritual leader. And because he was, but she, she said, I laughed when you said that because he was your spiritual leader. Yeah. You know, yeah. the prophet's your spiritual leader. And and he said, I, I think he took it the right way. But, you know, you're looking at Rios and saying, uh, President Nelson, this is our spiritual leader. Like, I hope he didn't take it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure he didn't. But uh, I, I just love his uh, humility and his, his, even though he's a, an old man today, his, his ability to reach the youth. Because that's really where this, where we're at. Yeah. It's always about the youth to me and making sure that we're doing the right things. So uh, we can, the future is always bright. I love the Iroquois nation. They have a saying in their tribe that none of the tribal leadership make a decision without considering what effect it would have on seven generations ahead. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the younger generations, those young kids are, are the future. And so um, I love that about him. Cool. Um, when you were chairman or even now, what kind of programs for the youth that do you guys have in the, in the tribe? One of the big problems that I have, because we're one of the few tribes that was not given a reservation, yeah, which is a blessing. And well, there's, there's sure. pros and cons. The pro of it is, and I go to reservations all the time, and it's not their fault, but there's a lot of poverty and alcoholism and drug abuse, unemployment, because there's, they usually put tribes on reservations that are so remote mm-hmm. away from anybody. No business is going to move there. Yeah. So, you know. Oh, and they it, make it so hard for businesses to move there. Yes. Yeah. With with the rules and, yeah. and sovereign nations and things like that. So. So there's a big negative side to a reservation. The positive side is they live in a community with people like them. Yeah. They speak the language together. They have community celebrations together. Yeah. And so uh, our tribe assimilated into the culture in 1873. And so we live along the Wasatch Front. We're everybody's neighbors. Uh-huh. You, you know, you probably wouldn't think we're Native Americans in a lot of sits- situations. We're educated. But we've lost our culture yeah. more, and we've lost our uh, speaking ability. So those are my two biggest challenges as a, as a leader, is how can we maintain the culture and the language? Because we're not speaking it in school together. We're not dating other Native Americans. And think about this. I mean, I married a white woman, and she had my kids, which diluted our blood yeah. quantum half. Yeah. And so... 
all of our children are dating people that are not yeah. uh, Shoshone. Yeah. And so how many generations do we have to go before we don't have any more Northwestern Shoshone? And so, you know, that always worries me a little bit because, yeah. you know, thinking 50, 60 years down the road, who's going to be left to tell the story yeah. of our people? Now, the Shoshones aren't going where. There's there's a lot of Eastern band that live together. And, but we're losing that ability to maintain that culture and language. And so we try to hold classes every Saturday morning for our youth. Yeah. To, um, they can come, they can learn uh, cultural things, uh, learn language classes and all of those type of things and how to make a bow, an arrow how to brain tan a hide, how to do beadwork. And so all of these things we try to still incorporate, but knowing that it's like putting my finger in a hole in a dam, it's yeah. just really difficult because our kids that have assimilated into the culture are like everybody else's. They'd rather be on their iPad and, and do other things than, than that. But we wrote, a, I wrote a grant with a professor, Brianna Litz, that we, Utah State University, and, and we were funded by the National Science Service for a three-year, $1.2 million grant to uh, incorporate technology in with our youth. So with this grant, what we're doing, and, and it's really been helpful, we're engaging our youth to interview tribal elders, but we're giving them technology, video cameras, that they're doing the interviews, yeah. they're doing the filming, they get a laptop if they want to participate. So we're spending this money using technology, and it's really engaged a gr bunch of our children that have never wanted to be involved with it before. Or maybe mm -hmm. they didn't know how to Or be how to be involved with it, because they have technology. I, if I have a computer question, I call my grandson. Uh -huh. So... They're using technology now, but they're interviewing elders about these old stories and old histories. And it's been powerful for them, but it's been powerful for the, the elders because they get to do what they've always were supposed to do. When you get to be an elder, you get to disseminate your knowledge to the youth. Yeah. Well, this last generation or two has never really had that chance because the world has changed. So we've actually brought back the ability to do that. And it's really been uh, wonderful for the elders and the youth because it's got them engaged in the process. That's so amazing. Yeah, it's, it, you know, she, Brianne, I sat with her at a luncheon and I first met her and she said, what's your biggest challenge as a tribal leader? I said, language and culture. She goes, well, I teach technology and there's got to be a way we can work together Yeah. to make this work in today's world. And we came up with the idea of doing this, and it was funded. And so it's been really awesome to see. I can I can see the Lord's hand in that. For oh, sure. I can too. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. It's, that's so great. I love that for you guys. Um, okay. So unless there's anything else you want to talk about, is there anything else I should ask you about? No, I don't think, I don't think so. Okay. You've done a good job today. Okay. So my last question for you is, what does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? No, you know, once I gained a testimony of the Book of Mormon and really started studying the Book of Mormon and, and who the Book of Mormon was written to, it was written to the Lamanites for these days, our time. And so uh, the fact that... Uh, I am one of the descendants of those people. It is really powerful to me because uh, as we gather Israel and as we as as the world comes to an end as we know it, I mean the second coming and other things, uh, we're going to my culture, my people are going to play a major role in that. Mm -hmm. If you read the Book of Mormon and, and really understand what it's saying, uh, that that group of people that uh, is a covenant people to the Lord. The Lord made it, the Savior made a covenant to those people then that in the last days they will, will play a major role in the gathering of Israel. And yeah. so I look at tribes today, though, and I think, how are we going to get there? 
And I know a lot of people think, well, you know, they accepted the gospel, the, the, the people from South America have really embraced the gospel. And that's really what, you know, Joseph Smith was saying is the, you know, but that's not true to me. It's, it's, it's not true. It's us and it's tribes. It's the Navajo nation. It's other tribes. A paradigm shift. Something's going to happen in the next little while uh, to make that shift because we need to play a prominent role in it. And right now we're not. I agree. And so I just want to be uh, a voice to to my people to make sure they're ready. Yeah. To when it happens that they're ready to take on this role. And so, yeah, it's a wonderful thing for me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have really enjoyed this time oh, with you. I have too because I get to talk about things that are really important, yeah. uh, eternally important. Yeah. And so I don't get that chance very often. Thank you. Thank you. I really, um, yeah, having Darren here was so great. I'm so glad that he came Today I'm going to tell you a story about me and my husband. So before I met Mark, I bought a condo in West Valley right at the tippy top peak of the market way back in 2007. And then at the end of 2007, I met Mark and then we got married in 2008 and the market crashed. So our condo that I bought went down almost half of the value literally and it was just uh devastating so we tried to figure things out and i really wanted to make sure that we did it ethically and we did we did the best we could and we found this guy who's like oh i have this house in bluffdale that you can rent which is not the house that we live in right now and anyway so we moved there and it was weird we didn't own the house it was fishy and long story short um he didn't even own the house a business partner of his own house and his business partner was let's just say on his way to prison we definitely decided we needed to find a house that we could own put our name on do what we wanted with and make it our own and so one day we went to, we had canceled cable. Um, we went to Mark's office to watch a BYU football game. And we were just creaming the other team. And we had little kids at the time. So we decided we would skip out after the third quarter and we drove home. So I had met Mark at his office because he had been there all day. And I had driven the kids there. And so... Mark was driving his car, his truck home, and I was driving the van home, and Mark missed our turnoff. <laughs> he called me from his cell phone. He's like, I don't know what just happened. I just missed the turnoff. And I'm like, yeah, you did. <laughs> so uh, Mark came home a, a different way. Um, he got home just a couple minutes after I did, but he walked in the door. He's like, Andrea there's a new house on the market in Bluffdale and I think we should look at it. So he pulled it up literally like he walked in and turned on the computer and pulled it up. And he's like, Andrea, you should look at this house. So he, I come over and I look at it and I was like, that's the house. And he's like, yeah. So we call our realtor and he gets us in the next morning, like bam, bam, bam. And we walk in and I'm like, this is the house I want. He's like, yeah, this is the house. And so we made an offer and there were um, some other small things that day, like all these cumulative small things, canceling cable, going to going to Mark's office to watch a football game instead of being at home, um, missing the turnoff. I mean, like all these small things and the other things that were happening that same day that we made the offer, all these small things that we had not thought oh this is going to affect us getting a house one day no we didn't think any of that but looking back heavenly father had prepared all these 
small things to give us this great big blessing. And I still love our house. Um, I, I love living where I live. I love my neighbors. I don't love living on a busy road. I do live on a busy road. But I love my neighbors. I love my ward. I love I love living in Bluffdale. I love, I love, I love, I love. And I'm so grateful that Heavenly Father prepares small things like you guys should turn off your cable. Like small things. If we if we just do small things, Heavenly Father will bless us. And I just wanted to share that story with you. There's much more details, but um, that's for people who want to sit around a campfire with me. <laughs> I just wanted you to know that I know that Heavenly Father watches out for us and he prepares prepares us in advance for things. And if we let him shape us, that it will all be to our benefit. And... I hope you have a super wonderful, awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. If you know someone who might be interested in being a guest, please reach out to me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.